Hello and welcome to Wrestling at Random. I'm Jeremy Deemer. And I am Adam Summers. And this is the podcast where every week we review a classic pro wrestling TV show from a streaming service. Yes, right here on season two. It's all about the classic weekly TV. But if you're a new listener, we're not doing it in order. We don't have a particular TV show that we said, hey, we're going to start the season and watch every show week by week. No, it is all completely random thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours of pro wrestling television have been dumped into the randomizer it pulls a show and that's what we watch we parachute right in try to figure it out and uh, let you know if it was good at doing its job or not that's right and this week we parachute in to wcw monday nitro now, Monday Nitro, I went into the entire history of Monday Nitro, the Monday Night Wars, all of that in an earlier episode this season of the, where we reviewed a different episode of Monday Nitro, which featured the worst segment we've ever reviewed <laughs> ever on this podcast. Yes, the worst non-TNA weekly pay-per-view segment <laughs> we've right. ever reviewed on this podcast. I always have to throw that oh, in there, but yes. yes, if you want to hear us talk about Roddy Piper and his family, quote-unquote, and that 20, 25-minute, however long it was, segment that inexplicably drew a great rating, uh, that episode of Nitro was the one that the randomizer pulled earlier this season. That is there. As you mentioned, Jeremy, we go into the whole history of Nitro, uh, but here, the episode we're about to review, it's 1996, and it's pre-NWO, and it's pre-Jeremy watching Nitro, uh, I know from our conversations in the past. It, it is, and and so if you want to hear about the history of, of Nitro, go back to that episode. It's waiting patiently for you if you haven't heard it, and I'll tell you a little bit about my history then. Uh, yeah, I stopped watching wrestling after WrestleMania 8 in 1992, and I got into other things that were not wrestling, I came back to pro wrestling. A friend uh, said, hey, we should get WrestleMania 12, the 1996 April pay-per-view, WrestleMania 12, uh, and convinced me to get it. It was the Bret Hart versus Shawn Michaels WWF Championship Iron Man match. So uh, that was my return to wrestling. And so I watched that pay-per-view, highly enjoyed it, but was not a regular watcher of wrestling again until the NWO, once when, when Scott Hall jumped, that same friend said, hey, you've got to watch WCW Nitro because uh, the, the WWF is invading WCW Nitro and I'm like this this can't possibly be true and I got hooked back in right into the Monday Night Wars and I never looked back so and I never never stopped watching wrestling since and this podcast has had us go back and I've watched a lot of episodes of of pay-per-views TV shows a lot of episodes of wrestling from my my four-year dark period where I didn't watch <laughs> anything. Uh, and this is an episode that I did not see. This this was from my... I had a blind spot here for, for this period of uh, WCW Monday Nitro. And it's funny because this is one of those weeks where it's a show that I was watching regularly. I watched you know, Nitro from the beginning. Anyone who listens to this podcast knows I was a longtime WCW guy. So I was watching this back then uh, it'll be interesting to see what I think of it, uh, you know, rewatching it years later and uh, your thoughts on some of the stuff that you never saw. And especially because this is just pre NWO by a couple of months, but it is such a good encapsulation of how weird the post Hogan arrival pre NWO period was that two years or so between really bash of the beach, 94 and bash of the beach, 96, where it's not quite uh, the NWO era, but it's it's also not the WCW you remember from before then. It's this weird, like, Hogan's Heroes era of, of WCW, and I'll definitely have thoughts on that, particularly when we get into the main event. That's right. This show was from February 26th, 1996. If you're going back 
to the Nitro Archives to watch with us. Uh, at the end of this review, I will tell you about the uncensored pay-per-view, which is the pay-per-view that this show is building towards. Oh, boy. We will talk about that at the end of this review. But first, we will run down the show. Eric Bischoff welcomes us to, quote, the only live wrestling on this Monday night. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the hottest wrestling hour each and every Monday night. It is WCW Monday Nitro Live, the only live wrestling broadcast this Monday night. And it's coming to you here again on TNT. The Raw show obviously was taped this week. So this was a, the only live wrestling. And Bischoff let you know all night long that this show was <laughs> yes. live. Uh, it was live from Knoxville, Tennessee. It drew a legit sellout of 5,200 fans paying $42,380. I was wondering if there was going to be a mink coat challenge at some point, maybe before the show or a dark match afterward. Go back and listen to our Continental Wrestling Association TV uh, or our CWF, CWA, whatever it was. I can't remember what it was in that iteration but our episode of the podcast where we get all into that. Uh, sadly, no Colonel Rob Parker here like there was on that uh, on that show. No, and, and no Smoky Mountain vibes uh, for Knoxville, Tennessee no. as well. No, this is not in a high school gym. This was in, a, in an actual building. Uh, but this is a building that uh, Smoky Mountain did run uh, a few times, wow. but never drew close to the sellout 5200 that WCW filled the house with. They did a good job shooting this as well. I just want to mention that as the show starts, you know, Bischoff welcomes us. We see the pyro. They did that WCW production thing that I kind of forgot about where they would just use that diagonal camera shot way up in the rafters and slowly pan across so you could see the big crowd. Uh, and also, I mean, the, the building is very well lit, so you could tell it wasn't just your cookie cutter, you know, 15,000 seat sports arena. But I mean, it, it looked full and it looked good for TV. Steve Mongo McMichael, Eric Bischoff, and Bobby the Brain Heenan are your commentary team. Yes, and that was your regular commentary team at that point. And it not only was Eric Bischoff, Bobby Heenan, and Mongo McMichael, it was Mongo's dog as well. Dress, he they were dressed, by the way, fashion report. Maybe the best fashion report of any show we've done. Uh, Mongo and his dog were dressed in matching leather jackets. Heenan tells us not to leave our rented furniture. <laughs> Stay right there. <laughs> uh, during the rundown of the card, we're told who some of the champions are that will be in action, which is always important when we're dropping in randomly to know who our champions are. Ric Flair is the WCW World Champion. Sting and Lex Luger are the WCW Tag Team Champions. And it feels much more like 91 or ni early 92 when you hear that than it does 1996. But uh, this show definitely feels more like a 96 WCW. Uh, Eric Bischoff tells us that, quote, the booty man kicked some serious booty here last week, dude. And at this point, I am forced to remember that, yes, Brutus the Barber Beefcake was the booty man in WCW. And this is what I'm talking about when it's a uh, description of it's basically Hogan's heroes, Hogan and his buddies uh, running rough shot in WCW. At this point, there will unfortunately be a lot more discussion of and appearances by the booty man throughout the show. We're told that he was a spy. He was a mole in the dungeon of doom as Zodiac, which uh, that's a deep cut, but for people who somehow stuck it out uh, in 1995 in WCW and saw uh, a face painted black and white, almost Zubaz looking long tights wearing uh, Brutus the Barber Beefcake as the Zodiac as he would walk around the ring and yell, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, over and over again. See, I did not get to experience the Zodiac, but... Uh, we did review uh, a pay-per-view, I think it was the Slamboree show from 95, where uh, Brutus Beefcake, the Zodiac, had left the Dungeon of Doom and was the man with no name. Yes. And he took on Kevin Sullivan 
of the Dungeon of Doom at that pay per view, and it was horrible. Oh, <laughs> and, ter- and I think he terrible. lost. <laughs> yes, to a uh, a double stomp from Kevin yeah. Sullivan. No, it truly terrible. He had so many bad gimmicks. He was also the butcher uh, briefly in WCW main eventing Starcade '94 against Hulk Hogan. Maybe the depths of my WCW fandom at that point, uh, as I realized that the WCW I knew and loved from my childhood uh, was was not going to be around. Yes, uh, apparently he tried unsuccessfully to sue the WWF to try to get the rights to use the name Brutus Beefcake and was unsuccessful every time, hence the parade of wacky names that WCW came up with for him. Why not just Dizzy Ed Boulder? Dizzy Ed Boulder from uh, the AWA show earlier uh, that that we reviewed in early season one. Yes. So the opening match, Big Bubba, who is the former Big Boss Man, the former Big Bubba Rogers, uh, he's taking on Sting in the opener. And, and that's, I believe, a rematch from that Slamboree show like a year apart. But that was a match, I believe, at Slamboree 95. That was the we lights reviewed. out match with the lights on and uh, <laughs> yes. and, and yeah, and crazy table spots. Yeah, that, that was a, a good go back to the, the archives if you want to hear that Slamboree show. Um, Big Bubba versus Sting is the opener. As Bubba's making his way out, Eric Bischoff runs down the spoilers for yes. the taped Raw show that is airing head-to-head with this show. And Big Bubba. And right off the bat, I want to let all you fans know, with remote controls in your hand, over at the uh, World Whining Federation, here's how it goes down. DQ, Yoko is doing in a handicap match. Take the snake Roberts. You're talking about picking up some balls here. Over Isaac Jacob and Diesel over. Bob Holly is still around. Okay, we got that out of the way. Now you are where the action is, and the action is live. Now. He calls the WWF the World Whining Federation, gives their taped results, and then says, now you know where the action is because we are live. Yeah, just to put it in context for you, in 1996, this was something... That was extremely taboo at the time. Most, yes, very controversial. Yeah, most wrestling companies never acknowledged the other, let alone uh, gave out spoilers. And there was no TiVo. There was no DVR. So There was a uh, VHS, though. I mean, I recorded so both people shows. had Yeah, people either had to flip back and forth, or you had another TV somewhere <laughs> yes. recording on a VCR. Yeah, that that was the that was the that was the pro move. You had another I mean, that's TV what I did. that was recording on a VCR, and then you could go back and and watch the other show later. That is what I was doing in '97 and '98. <laughs> yeah, I sure. would I would watch Nitro in the basement, and then we had uh, in the house I grew up in, we had a little TV like in this like back sort of like add on Florida type room, really small. I mean, we lived in a small house, so just little back room little like 18 inch tv but i had a vhs uh uh machine taped uh, or uh, uh synced up there and absolutely recorded it and then would watch it the next day yeah you'd watch one live and then you'd watch one on on the vhs tape so yeah that was that was uh how you did your monday nights during the monday night war um pet peeve here sting came out without his tag team title belt and the graphic just said Sting. It did not have World Tag Team Champion on the graphic. That's- well, I think we'll get we'll get to the the thought behind that later. As far as him not coming out with the belts, it all plays into uh, the Lex Luger character. Uh, I did appreciate here that both men had their actual music at the time. Big Bubba actually had some pretty good like stock music back then in WCW that was pretty ominous and and rock sounding. And then we had the man called Sting as Sting came out. And it's a, a few things are notable about each man's appearance. For one, it's weird to see a uh, skinny version of Ray Trailer or, or, you know, less heavy version of Ray Trailer wearing the big Bubba gear uh, after seeing him in Starcade 86 uh, last season on this podcast and how huge he was. And then on the flip side of that, we have Sting, who he is firmly entrenched in his in-between surfer and crow looks. He has the surfer sting paint, 
but he has darker, like dark brown hair. And then his tights, instead of like bright pink or yellow or green, they're black with, you know, with bright yellow uh, Scorpion logo on it. So they're already starting to slowly but surely turn him toward that. And part of what was turning him toward that was the relationship uh, and the, the frustration that the character had with Lex Luger. Another production note here. It was something that drove me nuts all throughout the the time Nitro was a show. The the music and the ring announcer were always quiet yes. to where the announcer like the commentators were just talking over the announcer every yeah, well, single they, time. And it drove me nuts. It still did when I was watching it here. I'm like <laughs> I'm like we never hear David Penzer doing an introduction. Uh, you just hear it in the background. Well, it's, yeah, it, instead of actually having the audio, whether it be from the music or uh, David Penzer, the ring announcer, that audio isn't actually funneled into the broadcast sound. You are just hearing the sound of it in the arena. And so, yeah, it's definitely weird. It, it's everything sounds muted and quiet, yeah. uh, you know, which is just, it's it's a definitely a different production element. The other thing that, you know, much like TNA years later, and then even AEW in modern times, and they they certainly share uh, a, a lot of similarities in terms of who's on the production team. Is one wrestler's entrance music ending, and then the other one starting right away? You don't have that pause to then have the crowd react when the music hits. It just one runs right into the other. Sting howls, and this man is very popular. <laughs> yes, they like him in Knoxville. Bubba reaches out his hand and Sting slaps him in the face. He runs in and Sting with a drop toe hold. He charges in and Bubba catches him. Looks like he's going to drop back and hot shot Sting on the top rope. But Sting grabs the top rope to counter. So Bubba turns it into an inverted atomic drop instead. Yep. Then he, he takes him over to the ropes. The bomb's away on the ropes. And then the classic big Bubba Rogers, big boss man, slide under the bottom rope to the floor, hit that uppercut back in the ring quickly. He gets a two count. And this is where I note, man, big Bubba Rogers is moving here. He is. He is showing off the quickness. Even Heenan is impressed with uh, how Bubba is moving here. And uh, Bubba with a spine buster cuts Sting off. Sting mm-hmm. sent to the corner. Bubba hits a stinger splash on Sting, <laughs> squashing yeah. him in the corner. All Bubba Rogers, all all Big Bubba so far. Uh, he held Sting open and gives him this hard body shot. And Eric Bischoff describes this as grapevining the leg and burying the webbing between his thumb and index <laughs> finger into the throat of Sting. What? That is not yeah. what happened. <laughs> I didn't understand this at all. This was literally him half putting him in, a, in an abdominal stretch and then he just punched him in the ribs yeah. and somehow this was the webbing to the throat <laughs> i i don't understand i will say that while bischoff was not great in that description of the move uh heenan and bischoff were great here getting us caught up on this whole sordid sting lex yes. luger jimmy hart saga which is basically that sting and luger longtime best friends sting has always tried to see the best in Lex Luger, even during his many heel turns. Uh, Lex Luger, while he teams with Sting as a babyface, as the World Tag Team Champions, is managed as a singles wrestler by Jimmy Hart and is a heel. And this causes, as one would expect, great friction with Sting. And so that is the kind of the story that this is happening here, where uh, Sting and Luger are each one half of the Tag Team Champions and going into Uncensored are each involved in singles matches here. And they, yeah, they definitely got us caught up real quick. I totally understood exactly what the dynamics of this story were. And that's a, that's always a great job when we can parachute in and get caught up like that. On the outside, there is an old woman at ringside <laughs> yelling at Bubba, like standing and leaning over the guardrail. And I love this woman. Old ladies sitting ringside has become one of my favorite things in reviewing this podcast. We've seen it in every decade, the 70s, the 80s, and now the 90s on this podcast. What was the name of that lady on that? Was it, it was, the most unusual matches no, tape? No, that was, uh, no, the, the, the woman was in the, uh, that was the MSG 
Ah, uh, uh, so, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I cannot remember her name, but she was a, a treasure. Uh, the old lady sitting ringside uh, at the the Battle of Atlanta. Just, yes, uh, just it, the these the, ladies. The group are great. of old ladies at the world class eighty seven show That's that right. hated Brian Adias and were the <laughs> only people into that entire show. I appreciated them greatly. This old lady here, both in terms of look and clothing. She reminded me, and this is going to be a very deep cut non-wrestling related, just warning you, but she reminded me of John Arbuckle's grandmother from the Garfield Christmas special. <laughs> that is a that is a deep cut, but absolutely a correct description. Yeah, I, I'm is, impressed you is. knew <laughs> Garfield John's last name. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, as a child, one of the only things I was as into in wrestling as a young child was Garfield. Wow. So it, it's a, the Venn diagram is, uh, is working overtime here, but no, she is, she is legitimately trying to get over the rail here. I want to believe that she's not a plant. I want to believe that she's real. The police have to keep her at one point. That's how a, I know this was real because like they were the security, re- like literally had to tell her to sit down. It was yeah, awesome. a young police officer who clearly had not seen anything quite like this during his six months on the force. Uh, just wanders over and doesn't even want to make eye contact with her. Cause I'm sure he feels like he's about to start laughing, uh, but he is able to separate her and big Bubba Rogers and the show can proceed. Back in the ring, Bubba puts his head down for a backdrop. Sting grabs him, goes for a pile driver. Oh, my God. But instead of falling back to his ass like you do with a normal pile driver, Sting goes forward to his knees like a tombstone with the guy's head facing the wrong way. Bubba was nearly killed here. I I was horrified. Yeah, this was a regular traditional pile driver position but then executed like a tombstone. Like imagine if you have a guy for a pile driver, but then you just drop to your knees like the undertaker. This is one of the only times I've ever seen this move done. I vividly remember, and I can't remember who it was. So I guess it's not that vivid, but I vividly remember seeing uh, a picture of someone doing this move in pro wrestling illustrated as a kid, but not actually seeing it happen. And yeah, this was unexpected and terrifying and then right after this eric bischoff is reminding us of uncensored and all these crazy wild violent things that are going to happen and i'm like i just saw something more terrifying than anything uncensored can bring me both men trade right hands sting with a boot and bubba is down sting has great punches by the way he He throws an awesome uppercut sting goes to the top he tries a vader bomb but bubba gets the knees up Sting tossed outside. Bubba goes to the top rope, but Sting crotches Bubba. Sting then off the top rope, hits a crossbody, gets the pin. Seven minutes, 11 seconds. This was an awesome opener. I highly yeah. enjoyed this match. No, I love this. Just a fun TV match. These guys had actually really good chemistry together. Uh, it, we enjoyed that match uh, at Slambury 95. This was a super fun way to start this show. And I just want to make sure people understand, you did not uh, uh, make a mistake. You did not transpose who was doing which moves. Sting went for a Vader bomb in the corner, yes. <laughs> but Bubba got his knees up. That is, a, that is a spot that happened here. But yeah, good way, good way to start the show. We then hear um, their game. Adam, com- I got bad news, though. What? It's all downhill from here. <laughs> the show it has is, peaked. The show has peaked. I disagree. There is one moment <laughs> coming up after uh, after one of the after the next match that is my favorite thing on the show. But largely, I agree with you. Uh, we also have to uh, we have to note that as they are going to commercial, they informed us, and I had completely forgotten about this. That in the two weeks prior on WCW Nitro, the last two episodes of this show. Arn Anderson had pinned Hulk Hogan twice, <laughs> which they were. They don't tell us how that happened. One of them, it was Arn Anderson hitting Hogan in the eye with either woman or Elizabeth's shoe. Uh, there was, I believe the other one was, was by count out. Ca- yeah, yes, count by count out. But either way, that's the setup. They tell us when we come back from commercial that it will be Lex Luger versus the Renegade, who I had no recollection of still being in WCW at this point. And I should have because he would be in WCW for a while longer. And I believe team with Joe Gomez uh, of all people, but yes, Lex Luger versus the renegade coming up 
but not before we get a commercial for WCW Magazine with exclusive photos of Sarcade 95. Yeah, so this is a commercial for WCW Magazine, the March edition 1996, with a full recap of 1995, the year in review. <laughs> well, given the fact that Starcade 95 had the WCW versus New Japan five match series, and given what we see on most of this show, if I was WCW, I would continue recapping that show <laughs> instead of talking about this product either. Sting and Luger are interviewed by Mean Gene on the ramp. Luger is holding both the tag team title belts. <laughs> this is amazing. Lex Luger is so good on this show. He is so great here as this over eager, uh, arrogant, but like fake earnest baby face. Uh, Animal calls out Sting for says Sting is a brother in paint. Says where's your head at? And then Luger is all super enthusiastic. Says tell him Stinger we're the champions. Yes, this this Luger insincere baby face act is fantastic. He is Gold. so it's... so good at it. And and Sting not buying it for a second is also perfect. Like Sting has no time for Luger acting. <laughs> <laughs> like no, like he's a baby face, this but is he still cares about him and he sees something in him and they're longtime best friends. So he doesn't throw him away. No, but yes, their, their characters are so perfect here. They are. This is exactly who sting should be all the time. This is exactly who Lex Luger should be all the time. And their interactions and their timing with each other is tremendous. Yeah. They were immediately interrupted by the Legion of doom, the road warriors. And, uh, they, 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 the Road Warriors and, and Lex Luger start comparing their Chicago ness to see <laughs> yes, who's well, more Chicago than the other. And well, yeah, the Road Warriors are saying they're masters of every dangerous match in the world. And Luger immediately jumps in and says, Any match, anytime, we'll take you on. And then the look on Sting's face, like, What are you getting me into? Shut up. Yep. And, and at that point, Luger says, Tell him, Sting, I know what Chicago is all about. Sting says basically you don't know what their Chicago is about. No, I think Heenan makes a crack uh, that Luger's from Wilmette. He's not even yes. from Chicago. Yes. <laughs> so so they end up agreeing to a Chicago street fight and Luger ends up asking Sting and Gene, what does that mean? And yeah. yeah. After he enthusiastically agrees to a Chicago street fight and says it's his match as they're going to commercial Luger says, what does that mean anyway? And Sing is appalled. And as we go to commercial, Sing says, why don't you bounce your pecs in the mirror and think about it a little bit? Just yeah. gold. Oh, it was gold. because Gene says he knows about the bars on Rush Street. And yeah. then Sting says, go flex your pecs in the mirror, Lex, and think about it. This was a fantastic, fantastic interview segment. Awesome. Yes. And then we come back from a commercial at this point, And Eric recaps what just happened. And lays out for us that Sting and Luger had already signed an open contract for Uncensored, which is what opened the door for this match uh, to be signed. At this point, we then hear knockoff Ultimate Warrior music, and then we see knockoff Ultimate Warrior. That Well, the, the Renegade in full knockoff Ultimate Warrior gear, the Kirkland's version of the oh, Ultimate yes. Warrior, he runs down... No music. And oh, that's was, right. First, there's no music. There's no music. Awkward, it was yeah. hilarious. Then the music starts when he's already by the ring. He's already like in mid lap yeah. around the ring, like it's an <laughs> NXT uh, uh, wheelbarrow contest or something. Oh, it was so funny. And then his opponent, Lex Luger, Luger comes out with his belt. Luger's holding up his belt and he stops to check. To make sure that he's not holding it upside down, which I approve of highly. I've ranted yes. many times about how people never check and they hold the belt upside down. There's yeah, nothing you, worse. You were not uh, in approval of Diana Hart Smith. Oh, that was one of the belt worst holding. offenses of holding the belt upside down. I also just have to say how much I loved Lex Luger's entrance music at this point in WCW. Perfect. A series of shoulder blocks take Luger down repeatedly. Luger, he rolls out to collect himself. He then comes back in, thumb to the eye, but renegade with more clotheslines. Luger's in trouble. Big backdrop. 
Renegade then tries a flying body attack, but Luger <laughs> yes. moves to the side and Renegade hits the top rope and is down in the ring. Yeah, Renegade is not very good. At one point, Eric Bischoff says that he's been spending a lot of time training at the power plant, and that is more a uh, a criticism of the power plant <laughs> yes. uh, than anything else. Luger with a belly-to-back suplex tries a backdrop, but Renegade with a sunset flip. Luger with a clothesline takes him down, covers him, and Renegade with a huge kickout. They are giving Renegade a ton in this match right now. Oh, yeah. He's practically hulking up. Uh, a, a few commentary notes here. Eric Bischoff at some point out of the blue says, kids, go talk to your parents about ordering uncensored, which just, I don't know why it cracked me up. And then also Eric gets yet another dig at the WWF when he talks about Lex Luger being a part of the so-called new generation and then coming to play where the big boys play. Renegade thrown into the corner has no effect and he stalks Luger, but then grabs him to whip him into the ropes. So so he he no sells being thrown into the corner. He's stalking Luger, who's backing away, and what does he do to attack him? He grabs him to whip him into the ropes. It looked <laughs> so silly. A, yeah. trans- a, a transition of some kind was missing there. And so yes. it just looked completely ridiculous. Uh, Renegade puts his head down and gets suplexed. He's he's right back up. Renegade with clotheslines and a power slam gets a two count. Or a power body slam, as Eric calls it. Then <laughs> time stops. Time stops here. And also this podcast has to stop for a second because we've talked many times about how much we both love the great Muda and how (laughs) difficult it is to imitate the great Muda or to do his moves in a way that looks anything like the very unique way the great Muda moved and executed maneuvers here. All I will say is that the renegade is no low key when it comes to mimicking the great Muda's movements uh, great or low key could hit a power drive elbow about as close to great Muda as anybody could. The Renegade here doing a handspring elbow in the corner, not the great Muda, not even low key. No, it's it, it was such slow motion watching this handspring back elbow. My notes say the great Muda, he is not, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and mine say he is not Muda. Uh, it, it was, it, it's. It's not even really a handspring back elbow. It's a handspring. Like he cartwheels towards the man and then he just backs into him. And like the the space between his shoulder blades is what connects with the the body and head of Lex Luger here. Renegade with a bulldog then goes to the top rope. Jimmy Hart runs down, pushes the renegade off the top to the floor awkwardly he crashes and burns onto the apron and then onto the floor all in one motion the best part of this is lex luger trying so hard to not see jimmy hart (laughs) luger then throws the renegade inside puts him in the torture rack and lex luger is your winner jimmy hart celebrates with luger in the ring bringing sting out he comes out which makes jimmy hart run away (laughs) And Sting well, says, yeah, not only does it make Jimmy Hart run away, but here's the scene. Jimmy Hart jumps into the waiting arms of Lex Luger. They are celebrating in this position. Sting runs out. Also, at this exact moment, Eric Bischoff call, er, calls Jimmy Hart a geek, which was great. But the moment that uh, Luger sees Sting, he drops Jimmy Hart and acts like he's mad at Jimmy and tells him to get out of the ring. So Sting says it's it's him or me. And Luger says, fine, give Renegade the match by DQ. He, he raises the Renegade's hand. Sting freaks out, yelling in Luger's face, what's going on with you anyway? He the- says, you are pathetic. He aggressively gets up in his face. Luger is up against the ropes, and Sting has his hands on the top rope. So basically, Luger can't get away from him. The thing that makes this so great is this is all off microphone. Nobody is holding a microphone. It's only being picked up by the mics 
it, by the, the audio of the actual ringside camera shooting it. And it makes it so much more believable. And it seems so much more uh, intense between these two guys than if you had uh, both guys holding microphones, doing pro wrestling promos. I loved every moment of everything after this match, as much as the match itself was terrible. The match was five minutes and 47 seconds of showcasing the Renegades offense. <laughs> yes. So if you want to know. On Nitro. Oh, so against yeah, Lex Luger, one half of the world tag team champions and probably one of the, the top six heavyweights in the company. After commercial, we get Harlem Heat versus the Road Warriors. I don't think I've ever seen this match uh, so I was pretty excited. I'm like, hey, these are these are two teams that that I'm I'm into watching here. This will be fun. Harlem Heat and the Road Warriors. And not only is it Harlem Heat and the Road Warriors, but we get to hear that Harlem Heat music. Oh, it's on the Mount Rushmore of great theme songs. Booker T starts out with Hawk, and it's all Booker to start the match, and we're off to a good start. Yeah, but- Booker is incredible here. This is the absolute height. And I remember this watching real time as a 15 year old, everybody who is a WCW fan at this point, as much as people thought Harlem heat were a good team, everybody was ready for Booker T to break out and be a singles guy already here in 1996. We've talked uh, before about so many of the great tag teams of the eighties and nineties being, you know, a flashy guy and a setup guy. You know, you talk about, you know, Bret Hart and a Jim Neidhart as one example of that. I don't know there's ever been a better example of that than Booker T as the flashy guy. And then Steve Ray is just the setup guy, the guy that exists in a tag team. But if you take away the tag team, he he barely is even a guy. If you go back to that 1995 Slamboree show we reviewed, uh, Stevie Ray does do a very flashy bottom oh, rope God. splash. <laughs> the, no, it's the bottom rope leg drop. <laughs> the he, bottom rope leg he drop. jumps from the first rope, lands on his feet, and then does a leg drop. One of my my favorite, I don't know if we call it high risk, medium risk, or low risk moves, but one of the great moments of this podcast was seeing that and, and reacting to it. Uh, but yeah, Booker T, uh, I thought looked awesome here. He was, was awesome Hawk here. and Booker starting. Unfortunately, Hawk out of the corner hits a clothesline and a drop kick, a neck breaker by Hawk animal tags in. And you know, they, the, the commentary starts cracking me up here. Cause they're, they're talking about mothers on Russian division in <laughs> yes. Chicago. Uh, both Heenan and Bischoff had realized they both have partied there, and it, like it was... real time, they realized this. This was an actual leg- like this wasn't a bit. It was them talking about it and then mentioning the cross streets and be like, "Oh yeah, I used to go there too. You used to go there." It was hilarious. And then Heenan gets in a great line as well about how the road warriors used to fight outside the bars and then throw guys into the bars. That was kind of the uh, the jumping off point for this. Uh, this reminiscing from Eric Bischoff and Bobby Heenan. And Stevie Ray now in goes to work on Animal. This doesn't last long. Big clotheslines by Animal. Hawk's back in. Stevie Ray hits a release powerbomb on Hawk. It Out of nowhere. Like, talk about a transitional move. Just this <laughs> huge, awkward-looking powerbomb on Hawk out of nowhere. And then Booker hits a beautiful axe kick. Yeah, that power bomb looked less cool than it sounds. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did get a good double team by Harlem Heat. Loud LOD chant, and that perfect axe kick by Booker gets a two count. That's followed up by some wacky martial arts from Stevie Ray. <laughs> a front face lock on Hawk, who fights out. He charges Stevie in the corner, but misses. Booker T hits the big sidekick. A double team suplex. Hawk sent into the buckle. He he bounces off chest first, so the back of his head ends up bonking into Booker's head. We got a lot of that on this show. That was like a very 80s thing here that was prevalent on this episode of Nitro uh, in 1996. Also at this moment, a, a nice touch from Eric Bischoff on commentary is he said that the WCW executive committee just informed him via his earpiece that this match is a official number one contenders match for the tag team titles. Hawk makes the hot tag to Animal, who runs wild. All four men are in. Animal and Stevie fight to the floor. 
Booker has Hawk down after a side slam. He goes to the top rope, hits the flip into a leg drop known as the Harlem Hangover. You are skipping over a very important thing here that I noted and we have to talk about. At one point, Animal hits a great standing drop kick. Eric Bischoff says Animal is not known for his drop kicks. And I note... Eric Bischoff is not a time traveling listener of this podcast, apparently, because we have noted several times several how times. shockingly great Animal <laughs> standing drop kick is. Yes, and Animal and the aforementioned Jim Neidhart always. Yes. Uh, yeah, they. We know when an, that Animal is going to break out a standing drop kick, but we never. We always forget that Neidhart's <laughs> yes, going to do it, and we're exactly. always impressed when yes. either man does it. Yeah, so. absolutely. But yeah, uh, the other thing just to mention or to reiterate what you said that somersault leg drop, the Harlem Hangover from Booker T, a huge man. It was crazy to see him do this move in 1996, and it's even more wild now to look back. Uh, some people 25 loved it. The years. people oh. freaked out for it. It was oh. awesome. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, again, it's still now. If you saw someone this size or even a, a cruiserweight level guy doing this move in modern times, people would still jump out of their seats. The ref, unfortunately, is tending to Stevie Ray on the outside for no apparent reason. Because he's Nick Patrick. <sighs> Animal with a big boot from the apron hits Booker in the face. Hawk crawls over for the cover and gets the pin. It was a weird out-of-nowhere finish. This, yeah. The match was 7 minutes, 47 seconds, and I thought Booker T was the only thing that looked good here. I thought the Road Warriors... Did not look good at all, and and Stevie Ray was Stevie Ray. Yeah, Stevie Ray was Stevie Ray. This was th this odd return to WCW for the Road Warriors that everyone was excited about. It didn't really work, I think, to the level that people had hoped. It also was was sort of doomed by the same thing we saw with the Road Warriors, the Legion of Doom, a lot in the WWF, where they were selling way too much here. Like yep. the formula for the Road Warriors. Uh, you know, let's say you're a fan who grew up watching Nitro. You didn't grow up watching the Road Warriors as a kid. The formula for the Road Warriors is basically them as a tag team version of Bill Goldberg. Go out there, kill guys, don't sell, look scary, build to the big match. Here, like that match, uh, I think it might have been, was it the match against the Hart Foundation or somebody it was. Uh, it was that Hart we Foundation. talked about? Yeah, where it was just, they were selling, they were just like any other tag team. It, it does not work. It didn't work here. Uh, just a note on that finish. The reason that Booker T was wide open to get hit by that almost Yakuza kick from Animal on the apron was he was leaning through the ropes to try to get the attention of Nick Patrick to get back into the ring and count after that Harlem hangover. Uh, this just felt to me like they didn't want to beat Harlem Heat cleanly, but they needed to have the Road Warriors win which those situations always beg the question, why did you book the match? Right. You could have just had the Road Warriors beat the American Mals and got the same thing done. Because really, it didn't make the Road Warriors look good at all. And no. it also, if we just had the situation where Lex Luger is just like weaselly heel, and then the Road Warriors win in a really cheap way to get their title shot at Luger and Sting going into uncensored, it just it didn't work. Main event time. Ric Flair, accompanied by Woman and Miss Elizabeth, come out first. Flair's partner is Arn Anderson and Kevin Sullivan. The Taskmaster, the leader of the Dungeon of Doom. This was the point where, after many years of not only, uh, or many months at least, of not only each side feuding with Hogan's crew, uh, but the Horsemen and the Dungeon of Doom going at it with each other, they had called a truce. Uh, they had unified to try to take out Hogan and his guys. So, yes, it was the Horsemen and the Dungeon of Doom teaming up to take on Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage. That's right. The Mega Powers reunited here some seven years later. And the Booty Man. Bischoff kept calling him the Mega Powers. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I was surprised to hear him that uh, that openly calling them the Mega Powers. I guess this was a few months shy of that WWF lawsuit, so <laughs> he would get a little bit more careful uh, as 1996 rolled into 1997. 
all six men brawl at the start, and the good guys clear the ring. Arn outside begging for a timeout, but Hogan throws him into the ring. Kimberly Page, the wife of Diamond Dallas Page. A very young Kimberly comes down to the ring. Yeah, she, well, she's just on the, the, the ramp to the ring with flowers. Uh, this was the start of uh, her eventually managing the booty man. Which uh, was so awkward. We've talked before about wrestling storyline couples that had no discernible chemistry and you would never in a million years seeing them next to each other and how they interact think that they would ever even hold hands much much less anything else uh sean stasiak and stacy keebler uh, fit into that category maurice ted and D- ted dibiase <laughs> <laughs> yes maurice and ted dibiase in parentheses junior uh fall into that category and man if we had gotten an episode of kimberly with the booty man, you 100% would be with me thinking that they were not a, uh, that was one of those where it's like, all right, uh, I'm Hogan's buddy. So I'm going to get to be with Kimberly. That's basically what the situation <laughs> was. Uh, a few other just weird things about this seeing Hulk Hogan and friends run wild on Arn Anderson and Ric Flair in Knoxville, Tennessee is just bizarre. It just feels like some alternate universe. Uh, and then the other thing, just as we get going and as this match goes on, you realize that Flair never, and even Arn, and yes, he had had those two very, very cheap wins uh, in the previous weeks that really did not do anything for him. Nobody ever, ever got to get any sustained offense on Hogan in WCW at this point. You think that Hogan was... Uh, a Superman as far as his character in the WWF in the late eighties and early nineties, nothing compared to how much he just didn't have to sell for anybody, anything at any time uh, like he did in WCW. Triple team on Arn Anderson. A, uh, we get a high knee by the booty man. Get it. <laughs> Do we get it? Do high we? knee. Get it. Oh, uh, that, that was the, yeah. That, God, I didn't even think of that's that. That's why a, the booty man does a high knee. Uh, uh. It's a real stretch too, because it was a medium knee. <laughs> a at medium best. Knee. <laughs> this yes. was, if we're talking about a top rope leg drop and then Stevie Ray doing a first rope leg drop, this was much more like the ladder. If you're calling a high knee uh, in terms of elevation. The booty man with a sleeper on Arn. Sullivan runs in. He gets put in the sleeper. Flair comes in, but he just struts around. No <laughs> sleeper for him. No. Flair with a test of strength with the booty man. We do get Flair yelling in pain, which is one of my favorite things we talk about here on the podcast. The best part of this match by far was that uh, we cannot, I mean, we could spend another hour talking about how lame the booty man is as a character and as a wrestler here, it would not do it justice. It's fascinating throughout this match because this crowd, they love Hulk Hogan. They love Randy Savage and they are trying so hard to like by osmosis and by proxy (laughs) love the booty man. And as this match goes on and every time he gets tagged in and he's running wild on Ric Flair and Arn Anderson and Kevin Sullivan, each time that happens, they're less and less and less into this. They can deal with him being Hogan's buddy, but being the guy that's like running roughshod over the horseman, uh, people are growing tired of it very quickly. No, and watching this, it makes me think, how did Brutus Beefcake ever get over as like a popular wrestler? Because watching this, this is horrible. This is the exact same thing he was doing in 88, 89 when he was really over. And and this is he's versus the 90s. And it's the WWF audience versus the WCW audience. It's unbelievable. Because yeah, he's doing all the same stuff. stuff. We the weird hip shaking, the, the the weird facial expressions, the terrible wrestling, the terrible moving. And it, as you said, it was very over in the mid card uh, in the WWF. It was not that over here uh, in the main event on Nitro. And he, again, he's surrounded by the biggest stars in pro wrestling. You can make an argument that from the mid 80s till this exact point, Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage are the three biggest stars in pro wrestling. 
and he's there with them, and that can't even pull him up. Finally, Savage tags in. Here we go. Savage tears his shirt off, throws it at Liz on the outside. Flair backs him into the corner, but Savage fights out of the corner. Flair catches Savage with an elbow, goes up top, but Savage throws Flair off. Savage tries the double axe off the top, but Flair punches him in the stomach as he came off the top rope. As Flair just starts posing and celebrating the double biceps, and he turns his corner on the Hogan, or turns his uh, back, I should say, on the Hogan corner. Yes, and Savage tags in Hogan. Flair hits a chop and starts strutting, and Hogan then just attacks Flair with clotheslines. Heenan is great here, screaming, Rick, Rick, like wanting him to turn around. Then Heenan is not great here, as Eric Bischoff has earlier on in the show talked about the fact that Nitro will be preempted by a Civil War documentary for the next two weeks. Bobby Heenan makes the decision here to compare the upcoming uncensored pay-per-view to the Civil War. Eric Bischoff completely ignores him, starts basically talking over him, and moves on. Yeah, Flair ends up going into the buckle, up and over, onto the apron where Hogan clotheslines him again. From behind, Sullivan and Arn jump Hogan, but Hogan quickly just clotheslines both of them over the top rope to the floor. Hogan with 10 punches on Flair in the corner. And then the booty man tags back in. A double boot to Flair for a near fall. The the booty man beats up all three bad guys. With eye rakes, because again, like Hulk Hogan, (laughs) you are the baby face, so you use every heel move in the book. Thank goodness Savage is back in with Flair. I could watch these oh. two all day. The chemistry that Savage and Flair had throughout the years, it's its never bad. It's always good. Well, and even in the very recent past compared to this show that we're reviewing, they had an awesome feud, uh, I believe, in the spring and summer of 1995 in WCW that for a lot of people like you is a lost period of WCW. But if you ever get a chance Go back and watch. I think it was a match at uh, at the Great American Bash, building off of uh, that Slamboree pay per view that we reviewed, where they where Flair attacks Angelo Pafo. Uh, that was the impetus for that feud. But yes, Flair and Savage, tremendous. We don't get anywhere near enough of that here in this match. Though. We do not. Uh, Savage off the ropes, but Woman and Liz from the outside grab the leg of Savage. He turns around, grabs them both by the hair, but. Sullivan in, attacks Savage from behind. Arn Anderson in, beating Savage down. On the outside, Flair Flair sends Savage into the guardrail, hits a huge chop on the floor. Sullivan's in, he's beating up Savage. Anderson comes in to beat up Savage, getting the heat for a long time. At this point, Eric Bischoff is talking on commentary about how uh, Flair and Anderson have stripped Savage of his dignity, his title, and half of what he owns. I, I believe the story here was that somehow they they conspired with Liz, and in the divorce, they took like all of Savage's money. I think that's what the deal was here. Yeah, Anderson is in with Savage, but Savage quickly lunges and makes the hot tag to the booty man. <laughs> Which sucks because I wanted more of of Arn Anderson and Randy Savage. That's one of those things where it's like you don't think of, man, I'd like to see those two guys wrestle until you see them in the ring next to each other. And instead, no, we get, I believe, what was the third hot tag of this match to the the Booty Man. Yeah, Booty Man beats up all the bad guys, tags in Hogan. Booty Man throws all three bad guys one at a time into the boot of Hogan. Oh, God, this is so bad. Hogan is in the corner. His boot is already up in the air. It's just like he's paused with his leg in the air. Each man gets Irish whipped lightly by the Booty Man into the corner where they just run as though they can't stop themselves wrestling physics directly into the waiting stationary uh horizontally lifted in the air boot of Hulk Hogan so bad like it's it's three stooges level Hogan drops the big leg on Arn Anderson gets the three count gets his win back against Arn Anderson 12 minutes and two seconds 
Immediately after the pin, Flair hits a knee to the back of Hogan. Elizabeth gets on the apron. She put she's trying to put handcuffs trying. on Hogan's wrists, but she's she's struggling to get the cuffs to work. Time stands still forever. I'll give the production uh, truck some credit here, though. They go to the hard cam and pull away from the very close-up camera angle in the corner, which is clearly showing Hogan, after just being hit with one knee to the back, having to sell for what felt like an eternity uh, as he was waiting for Liz to put the handcuffs on. They at least pulled away. And then finally, at one point, I can't remember if it was Arn or Sullivan, just like taps Liz and says, like, we're going. And they do. <laughs> yeah, Flair... Got some whips in with a belt on Hogan's back. The bad guys leave as Hogan's cuffed in the corner and the show goes off the air. What a... This this match, we did not get enough of Savage and everyone. We, We got way too much Booty Man. This was a showcase for the Booty Man. Ah, just, just horrible, but, uh... Uh, Ric Flair is always great, and uh, and and the stuff that Savage was doing was good. But otherwise, oh, this was a terrible main event. Yeah, it, it absolutely was. And think about just the show overall. The two things that we said that you said, Renegade got a ton of offense on Lex Luger and was highlighted in that match, even though he lost. And then here in the main event again, which featured Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Arn Anderson. Ric Flair, the man who was the highlight guy of this match, was the booty man. As the ratings war went for this week, WCW won the week with a 3.2 rating and a 4.6 share to Raw's 3.1 rating and a 4.4 share. So they were neck and neck this week, but WCW barely ahead. Yeah, Yeah. it's, I mean, neither company was putting out a great product at this point. So it's not shocking uh, that they were neck and neck. The the most frustrating thing about this episode, we didn't have any of the sort of nascent cruiserweight division action. Nope. There was no Eddie Guerrero. There was no Dean Malenko. uh, None of that sort of stuff here, which exposed, you know, how how bad and how frustrating that the Hogan stuff, guys like Renegade, uh, how bad they were at this point. So I teased at the top of the show that we would talk about the uncensored pay-per-view that we heard about throughout this entire show. The uncensored pay-per-view in 1996, this this pay-per-view would air one week before WrestleMania 12, which I talked about at the top of the show as well. WrestleMania 12, of course, had that Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels going an hour for the WWF title in the main event. One week before that, WCW put out an uncensored main event, which was considered one of the worst in history. Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage took on Meng, the Barbarian, Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Kevin Sullivan, Lex Luger, the former Zeus, and someone named Ultimate Solution, Jeep Swenson. Yeah, which that is not a good name at all. No. Uh, for a wrestler, uh, needless <laughs> to say. And yeah, that was that triple cage match. It was. Power of Doom cage match. I ordered that pay-per-view because I hated myself, apparently. <laughs> um, and I definitely remember watching that. Dave Meltzer gave the match negative three stars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, we should mention this was quite the streak for Uncensored because the year before... They had had the uh, the match in the back of the flatbed truck oh, with uh, is it the blacktop bully and uh, and Dustin Rhodes or Bunkhouse Buck and Dustin Rhodes. I can't remember who it was, but it was terrible. No, Bischoff proudly referenced that match yes. on commentary during he this does. show. As if that was something that, you know, you got that last year. Just imagine what you're going to get this year. And like my thought would be, I'm going to get the other company's pay-per-view this month is what that's going to make me do. So that is WCW Monday Nitro. Uh, favorite uh, favorite thing on this show? Everything Lex Luger did on this show. He was a god among men. His, uh, his, his character... Uh, just completely disingenuous and the fake earnestness uh, 
just the interplay with Sting, the interplay with Jimmy Hart, uh, a forgotten gem this period of Lex Luger. That was absolutely fantastic. And uh, the best match for me by far was the uh, Big Bubba and Sting match. Definitely. And those two with shockingly good chemistry every time we see them. Yeah, yeah I would agree 100%. And just to kind of reiterate as far as the worst thing, uh, for one, it's Booty Man, hands down. But it's also <laughs> just this period of WCW where it just... You had a lot of really, really good guys, and you had a lot of big stars, but they had not figured it out yet. Uh, the NWO angle for all of the issues that it would have later on, like it's crazy to think that this was the same show that those NWO era Nitros 96 and 97 would be. We should also note, uh, before we go, that this was still in the one-hour era of Nitro. This was not one hour because it was preempted and moved to a different slot this was still when nitro was only one hour and that was all we needed Uh, if you were (laughs) going to give me renegade on offense the whole time a crappy match from the road warriors and uh all the booty man i can handle yeah an hour is fine you didn't need 10 minutes of renegade instead of five (laughs) no that's that's good yes so that quite enough yeah that those all those things are also my worst things on the show and uh, yeah, with that, we're going to wrap it up. The uh, quick reminder that uh, this podcast, we rely on your support. And the best way to support this podcast is via our Patreon, patreon.com slash wrestling at random. That is where you can get, if you sign up for the bonus audio tier, you can get an extra episode of this podcast every single week. That's it, it, There's a whole separate feed of bonus content you have not heard if you are not a subscriber to the Patreon. If uh, you don't want to subscribe via Patreon, but you want to hear that bonus content, and Apple Podcasts is your podcatcher of choice, you can subscribe there as well and unlock all the bonus episodes that are in your feed right now in your Apple Podcasts. But, yeah, uh, and... Jeremy, that point is very, it's very important because if you subscribe now, whether it be via Patreon or, uh, or via Apple podcasts to the bonus content, you don't just get that week's episode. You immediately, as you said, unlock the dozens of episodes that we have there that you have never heard. And the other thing to note is that as you know, the same thing happened in season one, as we move along toward, uh, eventually in the not terribly cosmically distant future, a break. Uh, between season two and the upcoming season three. If you are subscribed to our bonus content in either place, we will continue to have bonus content episodes during the season break. Another fun tier on the Patreon is you can be the randomizer. You can choose what show you want us to watch. We, We just pick these shows at random. If there's a show that you think we should listen to, you can pay... That tier for one month, you cho- you send us a message, tell us the show you want us to watch. We will watch, review that show. You can then immediately bump back down to the bonus audio tier, continue to get all that great bonus audio content, and we will watch the show that you chose for us. You executive produce the show. You are the randomizer. You pick it for us. All available at patreon.com. There's also another tier. You can get yourself a t-shirt. These are great t-shirts. Uh, they, you can bump up to that tier, you get a t-shirt. And then again, like I mentioned after that, uh, after that charge comes off, you just drop back down to the, uh, bonus audio tier and you continue to get great audio content while wearing a shirt that you can wear anywhere. We like to say you can wear it to concerts. You can wear it to your friend's house. You don't, need to, to... You don't need to save it for a wrestling show. I went this weekend and got brunch outside and I wore it. And I didn't feel embarrassed at all because it doesn't look like a terrible pro wrestling shirt. It's just our nice, clean wrestling at random logo, black shirt, white logo can wear it. You can support the show uh, and you can add an actual non embarrassing wrestling shirt to your closet. If you cannot support the show financially at the Patreon, that's okay too. You can support the show by telling your wrestling fan friends about us, show them how to subscribe to the podcast and make sure you you tell maybe your friends that used to be wrestling fans about us and they can take a trip down memory lane and enjoy some of these shows. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Just imagine also if you 
and a former slash lapsed uh, friend. Maybe you have a Sting and Lex Luger relationship. Maybe there's a Jimmy Hart driving a wedge between the two of you. Maybe all three of you can listen to this podcast together, mend the fences, uh, continue being the tag team champions, and not have to do a Chicago street fight against the Road Warriors. And with that, we're going to call it a podcast. Adam, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. I, I've been clamoring for more WCW Monday Nitro. I don't know that this is what I was asking for, <laughs> but such is the risk when you attempt the randomizer. This could be what happened. <laughs> And I want to thank everyone for listening. We'll talk to you again next time.